Um, thank you very much. I'm sorry to have missed uh, yesterday's sessions, which sound really interesting. And, uh, I, um, I don't know how funny I can be this morning, but uh, um, under the caricatures of uh, neoliberalism, um, uh, and that's all there ever will be, caricatures, I, I want to talk about a kind of activism for people like me who are not really very nice or very pure or at least uh, not very interested in being right. And both contrariness and opportunism maybe motivate this contemplation. Um, but, but it also interests me to think about any structural or dispositional shift that leads to the other side of being right. Um, shifting a habit of mind that we think we've already done it, but, but we always never really haven't quite, haven't really done it. Uh, and that art practices and cultural events already identify and materialize um, an intermediate cloud of non-state polity. Think of the artists that Brian Holmes has been associated with from Bureau d'Etudes to the Yes Men. Um, and, and this evening, you know, we'll, we'll already see moments where art practices have literally leveraged another economy. Uh, uh, think of Eddie Rama's work in Tirana. Um, and yesterday there were, and I'm again sorry that I missed the many discussions about dissenting architectural practices here. Ines Wiseman has worked on, on these same topics and I'm sorry I missed that talk about dissenting architectural practices. Um, and what we already know from the work of many activists is the way that new messages can be entwined around, embedded into media to form a double of those forces that, um, the, the so-called neoliberal forces that are a discussion of this conference. And activists have even created themselves as doubles of the diplomats and consultants and business management gurus like the ones uh, you see here. Um, but maybe it's a contrariness uh, that contemplates a further extension of that activism beyond the realm of art practices and cultural events that, that have already punctured uh, an, an envelope themselves and, and gone into the fat of, of ordinary business practices. An activism uh, that may be inclusive of, of many other artful practices extended further into the fat of global infrastructures. Um, moreover, um, you know, one wants to do this not only critically and anecdotally or rhetorically, but in ways that are consequential to the economy. And it seems, you know, it seems hard to do that. Could make my slide advance to the next one. There we go. Um, city states like um, I mean, we see a lot of the spatial products that just went past you um, as having the power to uh, generate a kind of. Actually, I need to go back to that slide. Um, Um, I, I look at a lot of the spatial products with this power to generate a kind of parallel polity. Um, and there's no question that architecture and urbanism is, is generating that polity faster than proper forms of, of official uh, uh, political power can, can legislate them. Uh, and doing so in kind of inverse relationship to architects' sense of 
their ability to be involved in these political e equations. Um, as uh, um, since it is um, uh, uh, the more architecture claims to be absent from official policy making table and the more the more it's clear that the space that's made by discrepant characters in the realm of extra statecraft is the more consequential architecture in the making of a kind of parallel polity. Um, so architects as discrepant characters and facilitators of power have long been at the table they claim to have been absent from. So a lot of these spatial products um, generate a parallel polity and I want to study a broader array of infrastructures with the power to actually alter economy and physical networks, visible and visible, made of concrete or microwaves, but also in that notion of infrastructure to include the secret hidden standards. Um, environments, the peculiar belief systems of managerialism that are, have the power to control decision making, the subroutines of logistics, and the establishments of standards in the back channels of, of infrastructure. Um, given that infrastructure possesses a polity in its arrangement and in its disposition, um, one wants to know more about how to tinker with the organizational software of that economy. And most of the networks are active organizations that aren't easily, easy to materialize. Um, they exist in an active rather than a nominative register. And um, so to think about them or analyze them means shifting into that uh, infinitive register working with active organization, with aesthetic practices, with relational aesthetics, that also requires a shifted habit of mind. All, all the while when it seems much purer to remain in the realm of art practices, that would be so much more comfortable. Um, um, but the other reason that it aligns with the structural shift is that on the other side of being right, is not only the uh, not only purity, of, but not only non-purity, but the access to more information for problem solving. I mean, we we expect the right story, an epic binary tale of enemies and innocents, when it's often the wrong story, a little epidemic of rumor and duplicity that finally rules the world. And while we think we've we think we've addressed this, but still monisms and binaries persistently structure our thought and habit of mind. Uh, and um, they are also reciprocally reflected in the logics and arrangements and organizations uh, 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 that influence polity in the world. The, the, the network infrastructures that I study uh, still often theorized in terms of universal realms of self-governance or the oppositional stances of resistance and war. And so then with, with all of the heraldry and theme music of empire and multitude and total war, our arguments end up structured in that same, uh, com with that same combative binary or symmetrical architecture that sometimes makes the grand strategies of the left and right indistinguishable, at least structurally. Um, moreover, enthralled by the pyrotechnics of combative struggles, I worry that we overlook other forms of violence, or the sneakier forms of violence in the world. Um, and without question, some forms of activism must declare their name as allegiance and resistance. And yet, by maintaining some of our customary habits of mind, we also bracket out in ed evidence. And resistance often left marching against a non-existent enemy, curing its failures with another purification ritual. So even though so many of our, so much of our knowledge should be organized around the epistemes of war and resistance at the battleground, at the barricade, um, at the border crossing, the occasional exhaustion of those narrative templates is often useful um, for seeing some other kind of 
false logic that might be stored in oppositional stances. Because meanwhile, power escapes, um, becoming the category mistake to our absolute logics and our zero-sum games. It, it wriggles out to take shelter in another ruse or costume, join another moving target. Um, and for every forthright gesture, uh, there is a duplicitous one. For every rational economic game, there is cheating and caprice. And, and often having escaped the bounds of parliamentary practices, these events constitute a very, very resilient form of extra state craft. Capricious, hilarious, illogical. Here is a rich medium of subterfuge, of hoax, hyperbole. Um, and indeed, the notion that there is a, a proper forthright realm of negotiation usually acts as the perfect camouflage for these truly consequential circumstances uh, in proxies and doubles. So, but happily, two can play at this game. Um, and the work that all of you are doing here, I think, is something that's considering something more like a dissensus that is less self-congratulatory, less automatically oppositional, but potentially more effective and sneakier. Um, and it's a relief in some ways to be not so interested in being right, um, to be able to leave behind a kind of competitive energy in one's discourse, run all the way up to the finish line and turn 90 degrees, wandering away uh, into another big pasture of political evidence with all of its fickle and underexplored logics. And that, that, I think, excites a feeling of resourcefulness and ingenuity. There is a large field of mongrel events and category leftovers, uh, butterflies that aren't pinned to the board because they don't reinforce our proper political expectations. And these phantom turning points, you know, not easily taxonomized or moralized within orthodox political logics, um, beyond the well-rehearsed political scripts and recognized forms of sovereignty, are, despite their lack of political pedigree, things that create a shift in sentiment, a cessation in violence, or a turn in economic fortune. And, and since it's often neither reason nor democratic process that, that is, uh, but, but rather an outside deal or a ricochet that's somehow responsible for change, you can find that you can diligently stroke the, the the fires of intelligence and reason, but it's this outlying information that somehow catches fire more, more easily because our predictable logics don't predict most epidemics of belief in the world. America, a good place to see those epidemics. So we don't want to think of um, the way in which most of our infrastructure is studied in terms of universals of militarization, uh, or universal uh, governance, um, or little wars between state and non-state, just like we also don't want to reify the neoliberal that's under discussion in this conference. I mean, you can be right about that. Um, you can acknowledge that there is a Washington consensus that's controlling the purse strings through the, the World Bank, and it's uh, a sometimes monolithic or seemingly monolithic or pervasive uh, uh, network of think tanks and, uh, and NGOs that are all speaking the same management ease. Um, and given that the notion of government has been diffused into a number of organs that are either state or non-state, you can, you can be right about their sort of background consultancies uh, providing industrial standards and sometimes for a substitute for law. Um, at the same time, um, and you can be right about that and allow, allow, allow oneself to be right about that and just be absolutely perfectly right about that and stay freeze frame uh, it, being right. Um, but I guess what we want to do is freeze that frame and walk around it, again, wander off into some more juicy evidence. So not the monism, not the binary. Um, 
uh, one can say there is one great neoliberal cabal, but the best part is that there's more than one great neoliberal cabal. Um, and uh, uh, while one can f bundle things into an er enemy, if you keep them distinct from each other, you can play them off of each other. Um, the Washington consensus, the managerialism, the ISO, the standards, the NGO. I mean, if you are too smart to be right uh, and not vilify any one of them, um, which might be the biggest mistake, mistake you can make, you can learn from corruption how to play one of them off of each other. Uh, everyone is seeing what the world can be taken for and extending their hand into another arm-twisting handshake. So there is a, there's already an essential dispositional shift in that shifted habit of mind that allows a multiple constitution, a multiple players. Um, um, and, and I guess I've already uh, introduced the kind of term. Um, uh, where it seems one can look at the, when I say disposition, I suppose it's sort of a tincture of uh, Bates and maybe a tincture of Ranciere, maybe Bourdieu. Um, uh, but one can look at the disposition, the chemistry of infrastructure uh, as it's ex expressed in its, in its geometries, in its logics, in its economic mandates, in its networks of association. But how do we analyze that chemistry and discuss it in terms of its patency, its redundancy, its hierarchy, its recursivity, its resilience? And also uh, that that chemistry provides a vehicle for or recipe for aggression, submission, exclusion, collusion, or duplicity. We're under-rehearsed in that register. Um, and I suppose um, I've given, since I've introduced a term, uh, I, I, I suppose it's, uh, it makes me just like all the other management gurus who, who long to be uh, in the various neoliberal, neoliberal cabals with all of their consultancies and self-appointed advocacies. They always aspire to the gravitas of the academy. They love PowerPoints like the ones we're giving. Management Ease loves the academic techniques, the seminars, the webinars, the panels, the numbered aphorisms, the steps, the neologisms. Um, I think of, uh, and they're always merging with academia. I think of Kenichi Omai's, uh, no, he's not up there anymore, um, Thought Summit at MIT. And I love the absurdity of the symmetry we strangely have with all of the neoliberal cabals that we, uh, um, uh, that we critique. So maybe there's some way of fighting fire with fire, um, even if I don't have flip charts and loafers and a body mic and uh, a PowerPoint um, uh, with steps, I, I'll try to offer uh, a few steps and neologisms. Um, in fact, maybe uh, uh, another reason to attraction, for the attraction to these various business management think tank cabals is their beauty. Um, it is a beautiful uh, uh, Babbitt-esque voodoo nonsense, uh, um, which again excites feelings of ingenuity. Uh, um, and says a great deal about the power of meaninglessness and irrationality. Again, if one's trying to talk about op non-oppositional techniques of activism, this, this, is, this is a good one. Um, the spatial products and networks that I study are always theorized in terms of rationalization. Um, but indeed, the, the more these uh, recipes become rationalized, the better they are vessels for fiction. Um, they are highly rationalized irrationalities with absurd costumes, uh, elaborate rituals and belief systems, always like the management gurus, always with numbered aphorisms. Um, I suppose with an airplane pilot after a while gets very good at seeing wind. Um, and I think in, in some ways, looking at these organizations, one, that is what one is doing. One is finally seeing, being, developing a faculty to see the subroutines that create space and also watch them 
inflate and deflate according to the slightest adjustment of logic. This is not war, this is uh, blowing up a um, casino in Vegas. So as, as John W. Meyer said, you know, the globalized society uh, is, a, is, a, is a rationalized world, but not exactly what one would call a rational one. And in the histories of infrastructure, one sees this all the time, the way the statistics were used to galvanize legislation and making the US highway, the way in which those same um, uh, desires are making a, a, the golden quadrilateral highway in India costumed under um, the... Uh, India shining Hindutva uh, sentiments of the of the BJP in a in a country where uh, uh, buying a car costs 50 times a yearly salary. Um, we can see that um, uh, the meaninglessness that's created here is uh, while we think of it as you know all our political great political tomes our Debordian tomes tell us to think that the the meaninglessness is a tragedy. Um, but when you see here, in the, the, uh, this is from the um, Love Boat uh, um, Tourism Park in the DPRK, here where a uh, totalitarian regime and tourism met each other in a, uh, a beautiful moment of mutual recognition, um, one sees the way in which meaninglessness also has political instrumentality, far from tragic. It's meaninglessness is the meaning. It's the it's the le, it's the point of leverage, or the strange spirituality that's stored in the emotional worship of golf courses and their celebrity sponsors, the way it brings tears to men's eyes to play golf in China, the completely capitalized symbolic capital, and these. Spatial products that we were talking about are, in, in, in Bourdieu's terms, if you remember that moment where he gives a sort of very uh, clear example of symbolic capital where, where the, uh, the father of the bride buys the second yoke of oxen after the harvest, um, because it's an irrational, uh, it's an irrational uh, uh, symbol of wealth. Um, these special products are selling you the second yoke of oxen, <laughs> and they know how much it costs. Um, totally uh, capitalized, symbolic capital. And cream puffs. Um, and the mixtures of state and non-state leaders, the, um, with their own jargony nonsense, Again, it's quite exciting. Excites excites feelings of resourcefulness. There's the new uh, there's the new location for the for McKinsey and Company here in Zagreb. This is the way they speak. Misi, eighty twenty QDT. Um, those are all uh, Podskorb, uh, Bohika. Those are some other things that are said. And this is not a foreign language. Um, um, or Puma. Um, uh, 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 a Bread and Woods era, World War II era, um, organization for establishing international standards, um, and it's, it's parallel the ISO, uh, the ISO 9000, the ISO 14000. Um, uh, looking into an organization like the ISO is, is, is like looking into a beautiful uh, religious brotherhood with a silly set of uh, techniques um, for creating standards, um, creating st the, the ways in which two, um, uh, two containers will clip into each other to the ways one keeps records. There are thousands of them, obviously. Um, and one comes across them over and over again because standards uh, make it possible to, to achieve a kind of coordination without legal center of authority. Um, very much what's kind of generating some of the uh, approach uh, between nations in the EU uh, as a kind of soft law. Standardization is uh, considered an attractive way of bringing about necessary regulation, uh, avoiding both market solution and intervention of states. And it's that kind of um, uh, creation of standards which is um, uh, 
an engine of the zone that I, that I have studied, and I won't talk about that so much this morning, but um, it, the zone is a kind of urban paradigm that is making most of the world, moving from its history of warehousing to, to being a full-fledged city uh, as national capital here in Astana. Um, the national capital as zone. Um, so this is, of course, the, the, the mythical free market, um, the heavily laid plans around which planning is supposed to have only a reactive posture. And I like to think about Polyani when thinking about um, uh, any, any mention of the oxymoronic free market, um, but, but uh, as that the that the Washington consensus and all of those management gurus are so enthralled, with which they are so enthralled. Um, but I also like to think about it when one's thinking about those choices uh, to either legislate around it or outsmart it with another form of entrepreneurialism. And so I like to think about uh, the wrong story. As we said before, power escapes. It's often a mistake, mistake to disregard caprice in favor of recursive logics. And it's the wrong stories that end up being instructive and exciting, like a zone that is a zone for um, housing um, critics of zones, um, Dubai, humanitarian city, or the way in which in the United States, in the cornfields of America, in the red states, have uh, you know, overhauled their entire economy to be not an oil but an ethanol economy, or the way in which in Japan, at the end of the war, um, uh, all of the new technologies that the rest of the world was putting into automobiles and aerospace went into trains, the way trains supposedly uh, 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 in competition with um, any other form, or, or airplanes in competition with any other form of transportation now merge with the transportation. The way in the United States one can uh, buy a gun at noontime and kill somebody that afternoon, but you can't have a cigarette after dinner. The way, and how did it happen that that the rolling that rolling that like a rolling stone became an anthem for a generation when it had no content about that um, and it's something in the realm of so, sometimes what's at play in the creation of the wrong story are are those aesthetic practices that Ranciere discusses or the relational aesthetics that Bourdieu uh, speculates about in an active rather than a nominative register they they slip through um, uh, to create and, and make of something, something that it, it's, it, it was unspoken. Um, Foster and Partners, Crystal Island, a gigantic uh, mono environment, uh, uh, homeostatic dream, 20th century dream of arcology made with petrodollars, uh, swathed in its own peculiar, slippery, aesthetic realm. Um, looks like a gospel tract. Um, Gilbert Ryle is our friend here because for, for all of the absolutes that we wish to make, it's those wrong stories, that those category mistakes, which like the butterflies on the outside of the table remain a kind of thumping evidence of something else um, uh, to contradict our proper theories. Um, and there are always things that, slip, that sliver through, slippery forms of dissent. And it's all I would ever really ask of piracy, is that it create a fallout between logics, between tight logics, between ISO standards and um, the formulas for spatial products, that it create a fallout between logics that yields more information. Um, for me, pirate is someone who's finding some other way to play between the games um, um, and manipulating the different players in the game. It seemed uh, this story deliberately not about the Balkans, but in a place that's maybe e e even tougher to achieve. It's a story about 
um, playing all the cabals against each other, playing all the managerial layers, the NGO, the World Bank. It's from another non-aligned country. Um, and when all the non-aligns were getting their um, communication, their broadband and their communication infrastructure from Intelsat, Africa was too. Um, but while all the rest of them seem to have gotten submarine cable at the, uh, as one of many thousands of strands of cable that are laying in the water, whether it's from telegraphs to coaxial to fiber optic submarine cable, the place that doesn't have any is East Africa. Still doesn't have any. In the 90s, the IMF and the World Bank were concerned over mismanagement and corruption began breaking up and privatizing the parastate telecoms all, all over Africa. Um, uh, the infrastructure is uh, uh, um, here all along this road between um, Mombasa and Nairobi, uh, or like the road and the rail, um, are sprinkled with new telecoms that want to be part of the action. Still no broadband. Along the same road, a billboard publishes 40% unemployment rate in a well-educated English-speaking population that needs broadband to create some kind of viable business connections for a piece of the global outsourcing market. This was supposed to have been the remedy, Africa One, but Africa One went to Cape Town and stopped there. Um, creating a new monopoly of telecoms on the western side of Africa. Um, the response was supposed to have been easy, a group of East African businessmen who wanted to extend the cable. Um, but by this time, the World Bank and NEPAD, um, NEPAD, a non-governmental organization based in South Africa, were going to insist on it being an open system, so while um, so while South Africa and the Western Africa was able to keep their monopoly, East Africa was going to have to do better, to do good where, where others didn't, um, and set up a long and elaborate system of getting the money to pay for the cable um, uh, and to assure that it have an open system, a long uh, uh, um, sort of protocol, the NEPAD protocol, that all those uh, uh, governments had to sign. Um, but the cable delays were creating the same effect that the monopolies had. And here you're looking at Dr. Batangi Ndemo, who was the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Information and Communication in, in Nairobi, um, decided, to play, decided to play the different groups off of each other in a, in a brilliant and elegant way. Um, the already privatized telecoms chafed at more restrictions. Um, and so did he, thinking that uh, the South Africa, the South Africans who were part of this and part of also other ministries were trying to maintain yet another uh, kind of control over the rest of East Africa. So he made, he made another agreement. He got in league with other uh, um, uh, entrepreneurs in the area. Um, he got one entrepreneur to start uh, to, to threaten a deal with CECOM to put a uh, cable in the water, and that cable started in the water. Um, he, he stayed a member of EASY, um, and then made a deal with Etelisat in the UAE to get a cable there faster, and whoever gets the cable in the water first kind of wins the game. Um, so all along that road that um, will now carry an extension of fiber optic cable, uh, there's two players, uh, a private competitor and a publicly funded um, bit of, of infrastructure. And it's a tiny little cable, but it will have enormous effect on um, employment. Uh, it will have uh, urban outcroppings right there along the old Ugandan railway. And what one sees is that it allows him to leverage uh, another network, which will go, another network of, of fiber optics, which will go to the most remote villages in Kenya um, uh, and not be uh, accused of having a monopoly because 
his friend and supposed competitor, who he's winking and nodding with, is creating a, 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 commercial, uh, a commercial competitive network. And there's a wrong story that comes out of this. In the zones that are all along that road, like here, the Ati River Zone, not a place where labor is forbidden to organize, uh, but a place where labor unions, required labor unions, organize. So Dr. Ndemo juggling all of these players, foreign consultants, juggling McKinsey, juggling the World Bank, juggling um, uh, the um, IMF, manages uh, a sneaky and elegant uh, way to play characters off of each other. He's offering uh, leverage. Um, um, like the leverage gift, like the panda, um, we don't resist, maybe, we don't resist, we give. Uh, like the, the, the great technique of leverage that the panda offers. In, in 2005, when China offered two pandas to uh, name Tuan Tuan and Yuan Wan uh, to Taiwan, their names meaning unity, um, the panda is a kind of steamroller of sweetness, kindness, and elegance to leverage control. Um, and there are many pandas. Um, certainly, we as architects are making, are constantly making pandas. Uh, um, the only thing is that uh, we never seem to leverage anything with them. Um, we think in the, that, the, that, of course, there's a neoliberal script that the fabled market is leveraging the will towards participatory democracy with these things. Um, with, uh, um, Eric Clapton in North Korea, or with the very love boat tour that I was showing you. Um, but the, pandas, the panda actually can also uh, um, leverage another kind of amnesty, as we said before, in its very meaninglessness. So that one's not left with uh, two poles of collusion and pure refusal, as we see in uh, Liebeskind. Um, but leverage uh, uh, it, there can also be leverage simply in compliance, but in an exaggerated compliance. Um, while we agonize over the collusion and, and resistance, um, one thinks about uh, James C. Scott's discussions of compliance, where uh, he studies techniques of defiance uh, among those presumed to have less power, and he pays special attention to Milan Kundera's The Joke, where the prisoners were um, supposed to have a foot race with the guards, and of course they were supposed to lose, but, but they complied in a very exaggerated way, so that they were sprinting in this kind of pantomime, um, um, and losing, let's, let's all run very slowly, they said. And it brought them together in an act of defiance while also absolutely disarming uh, their uh, opponents without expending any energies of competition or fighting or, or, the, or the fragility of a kind of symmetrical uh, fight. Um, I was going to show you a, a, a sort of audacious example of this kind of uh, symmetry in, in Ritt uh, Beregard's um, promise, uh, Mayor of Copenhagen, uh, promise uh, to create 5,000 um, new apartments in Copenhagen um, and big, now big, J, uh, now uh, uh, plot, now big JDS uh, said, uh, okay, <laughs> we'll do it. Um, built the 5,000 um, apartments as a, as a sweet steamroller of compliance. And comedy is another technique to disarm and topple uh, a, a custom construct has long been an activist secret weapon rather than arousing competitive entrenchment the comedian distracts and diffuses and disarms. Um, we already see humor in the world where humor, uh, where the, the, the extremes of this project, for instance, work because they're already 
anticipate the critique with its own joke, so that this is not really that funny, right? The loco pelago isn't, re isn't really that funny, it's minor. The world's a better joke of itself. Um, um, so it's less satisfying. But Francois, Francois Roche's dusty relief is, is, is a little bit better, right? It, uh, and this is in the realm of building also, which is harder, uh, it, because it expands into a, a relational active register, buildings designed for Bangkok in Thailand in 2002, and it electrostatically attracts dust from the surrounding polluted air. So the building's kind of continually obliging willingness to clean its surroundings, uh, a coupled, I think, by just how slow uh, this minuscule advances are towards becoming a gigantic, adorable fuzzball. Um, it's in this sort of visual, temporal, cognitive registers all at once. Very good. Uh, and its critique of pollution is something um, that's reified in an attempt to remedy, uh, but it fosters this kind of sympathetic resourcefulness in its own enthusiasm um, and, and hapless self-deprecation, so much better than rigid piety or green belt tightening. Um, lots of comedians had squabbling parents, uh, and they, they made that third thing that distracted from the binary. Um, you see, I'm offering steps. These are all steps to unleash our power, just like all the gurus have, have offered us. Um, um, so distraction and misdirection are equally powerful as that third thing that um, disrupts the fragile symmetry of opposition. Um, one thinks of Chauncey Gardner, uh, at, at once comedian, confidence man, beautiful soul, uh, whose meaningless statements about the growth of the garden or the inevitability of the seasons allowed him to circulate with U.S. presidents and leaders of national prominence. Uh, this Balzac quote, this is what Balzac quoted from um, Slaughterdyke, um, the genius of the third thing of coming at it from an angle. Um, uh, elements of, it's not just the elements of surprise, as Sun Tzu talks about, or Machiavelli, but, but literally a, a tangential um, uh, move from the side. A third thing, here's a product of Jerusalem, in Jerusalem where we usually want to mend and heal and patronizingly suggest the two sides share our lovely new idea of architecture or planning. Um, but this is a project which just looks at the, what well, you can see in the background, that there are people smacking each other. Um, but this is a project that just looks at those third things that disrupt the two, um, the things which are somewhere in between a museum of hatred. Little trap doors that open into another world, little sweet shops that are in somebody else's territory, little lights left on so that someone can uh, pray by the wailing wall. Um, lawyers and um, their housekeepers in, in, in cahoots to um, get beyond different kinds of laws around the border, or a casino that in Jericho that used to absorb most of the money from um, dot coms in Israel. Another one that you might think about is uh, contagions. Entrepreneurs understand the power of multipliers, how to play market networks with the viral dissemination of, of objects and aesthetic regimes. It's more than just a customer base uh, or a management style. Multipliers build a network w within which companies reside. And, and what's interesting is, is, is to learn from the entrepreneur how they do that. Um, while, while we have contagions and multipliers in the way we operate as architects, we usually want there to be one of them and for it to be universally applied. That's in our history. That's in our genetic makeup. For, for the entrepreneur, they never want it to last very long. Um, they, want to, they want to move. They want to move between. They want to be able to index the world, not just with one multiplier, but with many. They want to move on 
Um, and while we've used that anecdotally, there's so much more. Uh, this is uh, uh, Sildo Mireles. Uh, um, um, the Coke, you know, this project with the Coke bottles with, that, that he reappropriated with different kinds of messages. We have, we have things to get us going in this, in this way, to think about things that, that multiply in the world. Um, I mean, even in the, the uh, in El Ejido, a place that I studied, uh, it was a, a greenhouse plastic culture urbanism for uh, 200 square miles for growing tomatoes. It's just really the multiplication of a tiny detail of a pillar and a, a little column and a piece of plastic. Um, but incredibly powerful as it multiplies. Uh, again, this is relational form, not form as object and outline. Um, one can look at the uh, construction industry and see it is in some way the great cross-pollinator of so many contagions, more, than, uh, uh, more effective than so many of our attempts to make the volume, the building envelope. Um, unreasonable innovation in that same um, landscape of, uh, of it near El Ejido, just down the street, it is exactly the same landscape used uh, in an opposite way, used for the absorption of solar energy. Um, uh, so the entrepreneur is also contrary. Um, in order to be an entrepreneur, one, one has to think a new practicality. Um, one could also uh, think about how wrong it is, another kind of wrong story, uh, um, another unreasonable innovation, um, that the trains that Japan um, developed after the Second World War are, are now, uh, uh, they are now building in, in the Middle East. Uh, some of the most sophisticated high-speed rail projects are in the Middle East at the epicenter of oil. The same um, social entrepreneurs that inverted the way one lends money to in, in lending money to the poor rather than lending money to the wealthy because of the multiplier that that it offers um, had another example. One of the most resilient uh, infrastructures uh, organizations in the world, uh, Western Union. Um, that's at the beginning of most of my infrastructure studies and, and, and here at the end as the temple of the worker uh, to send money back home. It's in some ways an, un, an unreasonable innovation that, uh, um, which is ripe for another one, which is ripe for another kind of entrepreneurial position of, of the labor in even... Uh, um, uh, negotiating the innovations in the industry in which he works as, a, as another means of self-protection. And finally, I'll, I'll add rumor to this, uh, to this list of steps to unleash our power. Um, uh, the world is, is run from confidence games, and as we said, architects might assume that two can play at that, this game. James C. Scott, who we were talking about earlier, identifies gossip, rumor, one of the chief forms of aggression among the powerless. Uh, and while rumor is a, a favorite in any micro salon, it's also a practical technique of markets and governments, hoax and spin, raw material politics, we know that. The hoax that attempted to demonstrate that global warming was a hoax successfully delayed uh, political support for green policy. But two can play at this game. Um, um, we recently just finished some work where, that was playing around in the researches of inflexible truth. Um, and we wanted to contribute something slightly different among all the uh, fellow travelers in the realm of hoax. I've named some of them, like the Yes Men. Um, but so I'll show you some images of things, and I won't tell you which ones are true and which ones are false. But this is a transcontinental corridor. Uh, 
uh, train corridor uh, between Guadalajara and Winnipeg, uh, organized by, uh, uh, managed by a Spanish company. Um, this is a, a, a kind of illogical way of making uh, high-speed rail in the United States by making it um, run places where there's not large population centers in the middle of the desert. This is a um, uh, uh, utility scale um, solar power. And you can see that a little bit, uh, just a, that tiniest bit of, of Morocco would take care of all of Europe. That bit of Nevada would take care of uh, uh, the southwestern United States. Uh, this is in, at the Hajj where they are now using uh, green technologies in the tents to actually power the uh, air conditioning in the tents. And a, a really surprising project, sorry, a really surprising project in Atlanta where uh, um, uh, the rail, oh, sort of abandoned rail, being picked up by, of all companies, Walmart to uh, to create another kind of high-speed passenger and uh, um, uh, freight line. So this was a kind of rumor which was actually getting into uh, the material of the world, manipulating the infrastructures of the world. Rumor that could almost be true, or that w is almost true, um, not as a rhetorical confrontation, but as a way of getting the world in between your hands and working it uh, and spreading a rumor that it had changed. So I guess I w w want to suggest in that work and in work with students and, uh, and in my own work that we happily swim in dirty waters with all the other shills and butlers and go-betweens uh, looking for new points of leverage in the fictions and persuasions that we already have running through our fingers. Um, uh, so some backstage knowledge of the bagatelle that's an exchange and the players in the game and the cards that are being dealt uh, returns more information for uh, the techniques of a kind of extra state craft. That there's a discrepant territory within which we can rehearse impure ethical struggles, maybe a new species of spatio uh, political activism, um, not, not in the strains of epic monism uh, or, or in the one world of the left or the right. Um, so perhaps one expels utopian prescriptions in favor of agility and ricochet and cultural contagion, um, unreasonable innovation with, with a pleasure and attraction to obdurate problems that uh, continually resist intelligence. Um, so we're trying to foster another kind of curiosity and ingenuity, but really also just another seduction, wherein it's too smart to be right. So those were the comments I wanted to contribute. Thank you.